said, my name is Andy Bleckinger. I'm the Assistant District Manager with the San Juan Soil and Water Conservation District. And uh, I love talking about and learning about cover crops. Um, it has become one of my favorite subjects within soil health and um, soil management, gardening and farming. Um, in the past few years and just in the past uh six months alone being that you know we're all working remotely and uh, able to attend a lot of conferences and meetings virtually i've now attended um, a little over 80 hours in workshops and trainings just on cover crop in the past uh, year and i'm really excited to uh, get to keep uh, sharing the what i learn and passing it on to others and also through not only through workshops, but I also do a lot of different cover crop test plots and try different things in my own yard. So I'm going to give a little brief uh, 10 to 15 minute presentation here on the computer, and then I'm going to take my phone and we're going to go outside and I'll show you what I've got going on in my yard. So um, as we get started, there we go. Um, before you plant your cover crop, you want to know what your goal is. And there are lots and lots of benefits of cover crops. This is just a very short list of all the different benefits you can gain from planting cover crops. And in case you're not familiar with cover crops, basically cover crops are any plant that you plant in your garden, your flower pot, your raised bed, your farm, anything, when you don't have a, you know, a produce crop growing. Um, so the, the main benefits or the main purpose of a cover crop is to keep living roots in your soil at all times, um, to help uh, hold that soil together, keep it aggregated, keep feeding the microbiome within your soil, um, reduce erosion from wind and water. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot more benefits to growing cover crops than just those kind of the first ones you think of. You can use cover crops to suppress weeds. You can reduce your herbicide and pesticide usage by using um, brassicas, which are basically like your mustards and radishes. If you've ever tasted your mustards and radishes and they have that spicy flavor to them, that um, gets into the soil and acts as a biofumigant and basically keeps certain pests and diseases away. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole list because I want to go more into the actual hands on of cover crops, but there's a lot that cover crops can do for your garden or farm or flower pot or raised bed. Uh, but before you plant your cover crops, uh, once you've picked what your goals are, now you need to start put, uh, figuring out what seeds you're going to plant. Um, and so we're going to look at the four different types of cover crops. The first one is legumes. That's your clovers, peas, beans, vetches, alfalfa, sainfoils, foils, lentils, sun heps, and much more. Um, and the legumes are not going to have really deep going roots, um, but they are going to be a, in a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in the soil. And they end up fixing nitrogen and actually adding nitrogen to your soil. If you were to have one acre of red medium clover, red medium cl clover can fix 150 pounds of nitrogen per year if you were to use that as a cover crop. Um, so that's basically free fertilizer while also adding all of the other benefits of cover crop. So don't think of cover crop just as doing one thing, uh, one single benefit. Think of all the multiple benefits that it's offering. Your grasses, uh, these are going to have much deeper roots, and they also have the added benefit, or at least some of them, of being able to grow um, during the winter. So grasses are often used as a winter cover crop, and we'll talk about seasons later, but you can plant it in the fall. It'll grow all fall, winter, and spring. And then you're able to keep those roots in the soil, prevent, again, prevent erosion. And then those roots are going three to four feet deep. So they're breaking up compacted soil. They're bringing nitro or nitrogen and other nutrients from deeper down into the soil up to the top. And then in the spring, when you either till them in or crimp them or however you terminate your cover crop, all of those nutrients go right on the top of your soil and are directly available for your next crop that you plant. They also end up being a really good mulch left behind to protect your soil. Your brassicas, which is gonna be your mustards, collards, radishes, kales, cabbage, turnips, rapeseeds, and more. Um, those are the things that are gonna be your, basically your biotillers. Think of these as being able to replace or supplement your tilling. We often, uh, you know, the, um, the older version of uh, farming uses a lot of tilling, heavy tilling, deep tilling practice, 
but that really breaks up your aggregates, um, destroys your soil structure and your oxidizes a lot of your nutrients and you basically end up losing a lot of that um, healthy soil that you've worked really hard for. Um, so instead you can use uh, brassicas, which are like your daikon radish, which will go um, two, three feet deep in the soil. You know, the big chunky part of the root's only going, you know, one to one and a half feet deep, but the thinner part of the root still goes another foot de uh, deep beyond that. Um, so it breaks up soil compaction, leaves these holes in the soil that are then available for water to infiltrate into. Um, they also have really fast biomass production and you can quickly grow in just two months. You can grow a lot of material that can be used um, as a biofumigant to resist diseases and pests. Um, so if you have, for example, uh, pepper blight, which is quite common in central and southern New Mexico, and a little bit up here, um, but if you were to Prior to planting your peppers in the spring, add in a, um, a mustard and radish um, cover crop into your mix and plant that and then till that into your soil. They have found that that is actually able to um, reduce the amount of blight on peppers in New Mexico by about 90%. Um, so it doesn't completely eradicate it, but it makes it much more manageable and it um, makes it so you don't need to use you know, fung fungicides and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot your hand up or just uh, speak up. Um, but yeah, um, any questions before I keep going? I've got a uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, when would be, because we we are dealing with quite a bit of mustard on growing Ford Farm. Um, and would you like to uh, to share that it, uh, the importance of cutting some of the cover crops before it goes to seed? Yes, and I will touch on that when I get into seasons shortly. Okay. Okay. Cool. cool. Awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. Um, after brassicas, you've got the broadleafs. Um, these are going to be your buckwheats, chicories, flax, okra, uh, phacelia, and plantain, gourds, sugar beets, sunflowers, and more. Um, the broadleafs are going to be scavenging nutrients, preventing erosion, uh, helping with weed suppression, increasing organic matter. But one of their biggest things that they're really good for is attracting pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, so that's one of the reasons you want to include broadleafs into your cover crop mixes is for the pollinators and insects, uh, beneficial insects. So now that we've looked at the four types of cover crops, um, we should look at the seasons and when you plant and when you terminate your cover crops. So the first one that's the easiest one to start talking about is your fall, winter, spring cover crop because it's the easiest season to start with. And basically how this works is you do your harvest in the fall and as you're harvesting your crops, you're replacing your crops with your fall, winter, spring cover crop mix. Um, this is your winter rye, winter wheats, winter barleys, triticale, hairy vetch, Austrian winter peas, winter clovers such as balanza or red medium, and there's more options as well. Um, so these plants are gonna be growing for the longest period of time. You're gonna seed them in September or early October after you have finished your harvest. And if you harvest one thing in August, then you can you know, you know, do a, a late summer cover crop for a couple months, August and September, and then do your winter cover crop um, in early October. But basically your winter cover crop grows uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. And then in April, um, you can either let that keep growing if it's not bolting. If it's bolting and producing seeds, you don't want it to self seed because you wanna be able to control the seeds in your soil and not have um, your cover crops start being competitive with your other crops. Um, so the ideal, uh, timing with your fall, winter, spring cover crop would be to let it grow until the end of May, right before you're going to be planting all your crops. Then when you're ready to plant, uh, maybe you're planting your, um, your cabbages and kales and spinaches and that kind of stuff, then you'll, you can either till it in or crimp it in, depending on what stage it's at. Crimping is a little bit more tricky because it has to be at a certain stage in its growth cycle and it has to be dry enough. Um, Tilling is the easiest way to uh, terminate your cover crop, but it does disturb the, the root structure a bit. But you also don't have to till real deep. Even just going a two inch 
uh, two inch till into the soil is enough to break up that uh, root crown and stop the growth of your cover crops. Um, but yeah, this here is the easiest cover crop to start with because you, you get to, you don't even have to water it. Um, you just, you know, seed it, get it started with the last of your irrigation until mid-October, and then you don't water it. And even though it looks like it's not doing much all winter, it stays green all winter, keeps living roots in the soil. But what you don't see happening is those winter wheats and winter rice and barleys are growing their roots down into the soil all winter. So if you plant it in October and you've got two inches of winter rye, um, all of the fall, winter, and early spring. You're, you may only have two inches of winter rye up above the ground, but you can have up to two to three feet of roots by the spring that it has grown all winter. And again, all of those roots are gonna be pulling nutrients from deeper down in the soil column up to the top and holding your soil together and all the other benefits. A spring uh, cover crop is typically planted if there was no winter cover crop, um, or if you have a very specific need in your cover crop rotation. Like I was talking about, if you're planting peppers and you need to deal with uh, pepper blight, then you need a brassica just prior to planting your peppers. Um, so in that case, you might till in your fall, winter, spring cover crop and do a, a late spring, March and April um, brassica cover crop to you know, grow for just a couple months. Typically cover crops only have to grow for two months to be really beneficial. Um, and then you could till that in um, and till in your, your uh, spring brassicas to help uh, reduce the blight um, on your peppers. Um, let's see, uh, but otherwise, uh, spring cover crops, if you have already planted a fall, winter, spring, it's generally better to just let that keep growing because that's going to do a better job at outcompeting your spring weeds. If you till in March or April and then you seed in March and April, well, that's you're, you're now having your spring cover crop seeds compete at the exact same time as all of your spring weeds are trying to come up as well. And it's much harder to do uh, combat weeds. Um, with the spring cover crop as opposed to just leaving it. Now, granted, if you didn't have a fall, winter, spring cover crop, then you're gonna have better weed suppression with at least doing some cover crop than just doing nothing at all and leaving it to the weeds. Early and midsummer, this is a uh, plant seeding just after the uh, risk of frost. Um, this is more, uh, you now typically you're gonna be, you know, having your production uh, crops going at this time. So you're generally not doing cover crops unless you're uh, doing a rotational um, grazing where you have, you know, one area for grazing um, and then the next year that'll be for production crops. Um, but so this is a great time for doing uh, hay and grazing. And if it's managed well, it can last until the uh, until you get your first frost and you can get multiple cuttings and grazing off of it. This is typically more of your grazing plants um, for your uh, your grasses, clovers, millets, um, soybeans, buckwheats, that kind of stuff. Um, it grows really quick, only needs two months, two months to grow, and it'll grow until it frosts for the most part. Um, and then late summer is typically the most fun of the cover crops because it's the most diverse. So this is a great way if you've got a new area of land that you haven't really farmed much yet and you're trying or you're trying to do rotational improvements to your uh, to your land. This is a great way to within two months get a huge boost of organic material fertilizer. Um, nitrogen, um, break apart any compaction that's in that area and really prepare a soil bed for the fall, winter, spring cover crop and just have all of those nutrients from a, a quick two month late summer growth be ready for um, all the, have all those nutrients for the next seasons, for the next year's growing season. Uh, in the background image, you can see those daikon radishes. I planted those in August and that picture was in September. So they grew all of August, all of September, and by the end of September, I was then getting ready to plant my winter cover crop. But look at all of those, the huge daikon radish that were already, you know, a foot and a half long, tilling down into the soil, getting a lot of benefit in a very short period of time. Um, some uh, thing to consider is perennial cover crops where you seed it once and it can continues to grow and self seed again and can, uh, or um, not be a, an annual, but often the perennial crops. Um, 
this is great if you're just trying to get multiple growing seasons out of it without having to do, and you're not going to be planting other crops in between. Maybe you're letting your um, farm or garden go without crops for a couple of years, but you just want something growing in it. Um, it's also great for orchards um, or for hillside erosion control. And these are things like your orchard grass, tall fescue, meadow brome, alfalfa, uh, lots of clovers, chicory, plantain, sane foil, and more. And um, yeah, so th those are great options if you're looking for a perennial cover crop that you're not going to be you know, planting and tilling or terminating at different times. Uh, here's a great chart. It's on the USDA website. If you just look at USDA cover crop chart, it shows you your cool season grasses on the left and your warm season grasses on the on the far right. And then in between, you've got your cool season broadleafs and uh, warm season uh, broadleafs on the far right. And then you've got your legumes in the middle, cool and warm. So a chart like this can help you build your cover crop cocktail mix um, to help you decide what to put into the soil. Also tells you the plant architecture, um, whether it's an upright, upright spreading or ground creeping um, cover crop and how much water it needs and its growth cycle. And finally, terminating your cover crop. Um, it is important to think about how you're going to terminate it because some cover crops you can actually plant directly into. Um, others, you're going to have to make sure it's killed off so it doesn't uh, outcompete your produce crops. Um, winter freeze is the easiest um, because it's free, natural, leaves behind all the residue on the soil um, as mulch, and there's no disturbance to the soil. The problem is that only certain plants can be winter freeze. So if we go back to our late summer, um, where we have those two months to put up a lot of uh, plant growth in a lot of diversity, all of the or almost all of these plants will do really well. If you're just looking to have them killed off with a winter freeze, you can actually seed your fall, winter, spring cover crops directly into this mix because as you get those first frosts, these uh, crops are going to die off. And in the space that is left behind, your other crops are now going to take over for the fall, winter, spring crop. So you don't have to till or kill these crops before you plant your fall, winter, spring crop. Um, However, your fall, winter, spring crop is obviously a very cold hardy crop. It is, you know, your winter rye, winter rye, winter wheat, winter barley, and winter clovers. And that is not going to uh, freeze off in the winter. So you're going to have to kill it. Crimping only real, I'm going to get back to tilling at the end, but crimping only really works on grasses. So if you have winter wheat, winter rye, winter barley, those can be crimped great. Basically, you just take a roller and roll them over. The issue is that you have to make sure that they have grown until they are just about to start producing seed heads. If they're still too young, they'll just pop right back up and they won't actually kill off from the crimping. Um, so if you're trying to, if they're not fully grown and you need to get your soil ready to plant, you're not going to be able to crimp. You'll have to do another method. Herbicides are a method. Um, uh, you know, there are some benefits to it in that there is minimal soil disturbance and it leaves the residue behind. But there are, of course, drawbacks being that it could be killing beneficial plants. If you need to plant directly afterwards, you need to consider the residual uh, herbicide in the soil and how that could affect your planting. And it can disrupt soil organisms and potentially be toxic. Um, so there are things to consider with each of these, but tilling is typically either crimping and tilling and winter freezer, the three of the main go-tos, but tilling is kind of the easiest because tilling will kill any of your uh, cover crops. You just have to get two inches down into the soil, cut off that root crown, and um, all of that soil or gets, or all of that organic matter gets mixed into the soil. There is a downside that it leaves the soil bare. So if you are tilling to kill your cover crop or terminate your cover crop, you should be seeding directly into that soil um, within a, a week or two at the most. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot to cover crops and this is just a quick little introduction and I wanna head outside to show you what I've got going on. But any questions before we go outside? This is awesome. Thanks, Andy. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm going to grab my phone and stop sharing. I didn't know alfalfa was a, a legume. Uh, it counts as a legume within the groups, um, or at least it's often listed as a legume. Um, 
because it fixes nitrogen. I don't know if it is truly a legume or not. That's a good question. Okay, so let me flip the camera around. And we're making a biochar in our uh, two burn barrels back there. So that's what the smoke is from. We're just uh, dousing them with water so that they don't uh, keep burning too much because we want all of that black char to go into our garden. But anyways, um, here's uh, our south side garden. Um, this one here is about 16 feet by 32 feet. This one here is just about um, eight feet by about 30 feet. And what we've got going on here is all fall, winter, and spring. Last year, I planted that in a combination of winter wheat and red medium clover in the fall. So as this was all corn and lemon cucumbers last year. So as we were harvesting the corn and harvesting the lemon cucumbers and you know pulling out material, we were immediately seeding red medium clover and winter wheat. Oh, I see somebody just said, according to Wikipedia, uh, alfalfa is a legume. Uh -huh. It's in the family of Fabaceae. Well, there we go. Excellent, thank you for that, Melissa. Um, I'd actually been wondering that exact same question. <laughs> so, um, so this whole area was winter wheat and red medium clover, but it was so you know thick and you know grown in throughout the winter that we couldn't just directly seed into it. We needed to clear it out and. Um, also, want, I wanted to get rid of the winter wheat and just have red medium clover as a living mulch. So I tilled this whole section, just about a two inch deep till, not real deep. And then at the same time, uh, right after we tilled, we seeded red medium clover in the whole thing. Um, and then we also planted our spinaches and stuff. So we've got arugula coming up here. We've got spinaches coming up here. We also have some sunflowers that we need to pull out. Um, we used to have this as a sunflower garden, so it um, has still has tons of seeds. But we've got our spinach here with the red medium clover growing around it. And the red medium clover is adding nitrogen to the soil. So this is acting as a living mulch. All of this clover is protecting the soil, keeping it cooler, uh, reducing evaporation, and helping keep the living roots in the soil. Um, and it's able to be grown in along with our spinach. And here you can see our spinach is coming up. Um, we've got new spinach is coming up every day now. Um, and some of them are getting, here's ones that are getting bigger. Um, and then over here, we, um, we left some of the winter wheat in place because we weren't really using that area back there until we plant our corn. Um, so when we plant our corn, uh, we'll pull up some of that winter wheat because it's a small area. I'll just rip it up by hand. The winter wheat would compete with the corn, but the clover can grow at the same time as the corn. So it's kind of like a, an intercropping where you've got the red medium clover growing as a living mulch um, in with the other plants. Over here, this here is a spring cover crop cocktail mix. Um, this whole section from these wooden stakes right here to the left was only, it was just, you know, juniper and sagebrush, you know, crummy, crummy dirt um, with, you know, very little viability for growth. And so this spring we tilled it up, um, tilled in some, um, you know, organic matter and just some brush and stuff that we had to try to get at least some type of water holding potential in there. And then we seeded this cover crop. Um, you know, it, this is pretty poor soil, so I'm not surprised it's not doing that great. Um, but there are patches that are doing okay. All the black that you see in it is uh, the biochar that we've been putting in. And um, yeah, so anyways, at the end of this month, I'm going to till in the cover crop that has grown and I'm going to reseed a new spring or basically a early summer cover crop for that uh, June, July after the frost has passed. And so I'm going to do a more um, quick growth, uh, just trying to get a lot more organics um, into the soil and get more water holding capacity into that soil. So I'm going to do a two inch till at the end of this month and plant a new cover crop in there. Um, and hopefully then all of this will add to the soil and I just entered the waiting room. Oh, that was Alyssa. <laughs> um, now over here, 
we have our wildflower garden on this section, and then we've got various crop rows, peas, radishes, chards, onions, um, carrots and stuff planted. But in the middle, in between the rows, I seeded cover crop because I wanted something growing and trying to hold the southern, uh, soil together and have living roots in the soil. So I seeded just a, a small amount of cover crop cocktail mixture in between the rows. And that will end up being able to be walked on. Here you can see a lot of the winter wheat that's still just left in the row that I can walk on. And instead of having dirt to walk on where you know dirt is going to be you know, exposed to the air, uh, exposed to the wind, you lose a lot more water through exposed dirt. So I'm trying to grow that in with uh, uh, cover crop around my crops. So I can move in over here. It also gives me places where I can walk without disturbing other things. So here we've got all of our peas coming up and I've got a little bit of winter wheat still growing around it. Peas and grass, or yeah, peas and grasses are in the different groups. So they're not gonna be competing each with each other for the same root um, location in the soil or the same nutrients. So the grasses are still able to have the roots go deeper and hold the soil together um, and shade out the soil and you know, help retain moisture while the peas are growing up through it. I'll go ahead and move to the back. So then on the north side of our house, we're putting a little cover patio. So we've got some cement posts going in. Um, so this is the north side of our house where it's great for growing, you know, crops that need some shade um, or don't like the completely full sun. Um, we found that some varieties of tomatoes um, just have a little bit too much sun if they're just fully full sun um, here. So we do them on the north side um, and they end up getting about four to six hours of full sun a day instead of a whole day. Um, they end up doing better up here. So right now, this is just a cover crop cocktail mix that's growing in. And we've got three main rows. We've got this row right here. And then we've got one on the back. And then we've got this one right here. So this is currently that same 10 seed cover crop cocktail mix. And this is how the other side should look. Very, you know, densely grown in, really full and healthy. And uh, the other side was just really poor soil. We've been gardening on this side of the house for three years already. So you might be able to tell that, you know, back there in the back half and that back strip all have really full cover crop grown in. Whereas this one here has a patch here. It's got a patch here where it's missing some. Well, this is a new section that we just tilled and we added organics to last fall. And this will be our first season actually growing in this strip right here. Um, we did originally plant a uh, fall, winter, spring cover crop back here, but we let the rabbits out too soon and the rabbits ate all of the cover crop and then we had nothing growing all winter. So I, that's why I did a, a spring cover crop here. Um, instead of just letting a fall, winter, spring cover crop continue to grow at this point. In the future, I'm gonna uh, let the fall, winter, spring cover crop grow longer before I let the rabbits into it so that they don't just take it out as it's just starting. So that's just a little sample of what cover crops I've got going on in my yard. Um, talked a little bit about how you can use different cover crops for different benefits and at different times of the year. And at this point, I wanna open it up to questions. That's awesome, Andy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I've got a, a quick question. Do you, or, um, do you mind explaining a little bit? I know we're doing a, a cover crop demonstration at the Growing Ford Farm in Aztec. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you mind sharing a little bit about kind of what your, your game plan for that is? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, basically we're going to be using a small section of the furrow irrigated farm, and the goal is to basically show that you can use cover crops broadcast seeded, so not drilled, um, in a furrow irrigation system. A lot of times people think that with furrow irrigation you can't do broadcast seeding um, for cover crops because it'll then block up your furrows and not allow the irrigation to work. Um, and there has been a few studies and um, presentations I've been watching about people doing certain seed mixes that do work in a furrow irrigation system. 
um, particularly if you're growing um, corn and pep uh, can corn or peppers. With corn, um, there's two really interesting and fun options. One of it is to do just a red medium clover. And I've heard some, uh, some good success stories uh, these last couple of years from local farmers who are or you know, gardeners who are doing that in their own uh, corn fields and where they, they seed their corn and they seed the red medium clo clover broadcast. And because the red medium clover, as it's shaded out by the corn, as the corn grows, the red medium clover doesn't actually grow that tall. Even in full sun, its maximum height is 18 inches. So it's not gonna, uh, and it doesn't get super dense and have really you know uh, thick or heavy uh, woody material. So it's not blocking any of the furrows. And, the red medium clover at this point has been one of the uh, most successful of the cover crop or living mulches to actually grow simultaneously alongside corn. Um, and so we're going to have a plot that shows that. We're going to also do a intercropping uh, mixed with corn. There was a presentation I watched where they had a 10 acre corn farm and they did a 14 seed mix of all a variety of legumes, brassicas, and broadleafs. No grasses because the grasses would compete with the corn. Um, but legumes, brassicas, and broadleafs, all broadcast seeded and um, irrigated with the uh, the furrow irrigation. Now with that one, um, they did have to use furrow runners every couple of weeks um, to just kind of, uh, you know, uh, re-spread open the furrows, but they said just, uh, just using a hand furrow runner and walking down the furrows um, once every couple of weeks was enough to keep the furrows uh, well maintained. And they said that while there was a slight downside that they couldn't use machine harvesting anymore, that they had to pick everything by hand because um, that cover crop mix was probably, you know, three, three to four feet tall. And then the corn was, you know, six to eight feet tall above it. Um, but you had to walk through all that cover crop to actually harvest the corn. So they said they had to end up hiring labor to harvest the corn, but they, but their end result was about a 20% increased production in corn and a 50 to 75% reduction in water usage, depending on the part, the, uh, the timing of the growing season. Because all of those roots were pumping carbon um, into the soil, the roots were helping maintain the soil structure and holding on to the water that did get into the soil. Um, plus, the soil was so heavily shaded and kept cool by all the plants and the plants blocked it from the wind being able to strip the moisture away. Um, it, the soil just never dried out. They said that it, they were shocked by how little water they ended up needing to grow a higher production of corn. Um, so they have fully transitioned that 10 acre corn farm to a intercropping uh, cover crop system. Um, so we're going to have a section that demonstrates that. We're also going to have a section that demonstrates um, a similar type thing, intercropping with very low growing um, crops with peppers. Um, in that case, you would do low growing grasses um, and legumes and clovers, uh, legumes, uh, mixed in with the peppers, and they'll be able to essentially do the same type of benefit. Um, and then I believe the other section was going to be a, um, a grass blend that would be like a orchard, um, orchard fescue. And I don't remember the blend that we've come up with at this point, but basically showing that you can do a, a grass blend um, as a uh, cover crop or basically as a, um, a rotational crop in a furrow irrigation system. And then the other, the last one we were going to do was a MILPA system, M-I-L-P-A. Um, it's something I've just heard about and am fascinated by. It's a 40 seed mix of, it's got everything. It's got your garden seeds. So your, your zucchinis, cucumbers, squashes, um, beans, peas, um, tomatoes, all different kinds of things all mixed together that you are able to harvest and use for produce. But it also includes your pollinator plant mixes, your cover crop mixes to um, add benefits to the soil around these other things. And um, it's, it's fascinating. It's basically a 40 seed mix that's everything all in one, your pollinator plants, your cover crops, your harvestable produce. Um, so that sounds like an amazing way for new farmers and gardeners to uh, try out a small section of land. So we want to try that out and demonstrate it as well and see how it goes. Wow. 
I didn't even know about that last one. Yeah. Hmm, I didn't great. either until a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, we have got to try this. That just sounds too cool. Yeah, it does. Well, awesome. Um, any questions for, for Andy? Yes, I have a question. Um, yeah, go for it. I think, I think Andy, you already mentioned this, but I just wanted to go back over and make sure I, I've got it. So considering our conditions and the fact that a lot of people's water is, you know, basically reduced or eliminated come October, what's the better uh, cover crops for the winter? Um, so your, your winter... Local- yeah, so your your uh, your local uh, best bets are going to be, um, you can either do just a straight winter rye or winter wheat. Winter wheat, um, if you plant it in um, early to mid October, sometimes that's a little bit too late. If we get an early onset winter, um, winter rye is a little bit more expensive, but it can actually germinate all the way down to um, down to freezing as long as it has temperatures during the day above freezing. Winter rye can still germinate even into December. So out here, your best bets are going to be winter rye, red medium clover, and um, hairy vetch and Austrian winter pea. Um, those, those four together or just go um, winter rye, those are going to be kind of your best bets. That gets a, a, a good group of things um, and things that will be uh, cold hardy all winter. Uh, okay, now, if you. you wanted to do, if you wanted to terminate by crimping in the spring, then you would have to stick to just a, a single crop of the winter rye um, or winter wheat. Um, but that one's harder to plan out here. Um, like this year, we have had we haven't had hat frost in like you know the past few weeks, and we don't have anything in the schedule. Knocking on wood, making sure we don't, because um, we're we're really lucky this season. Um, so depending on the season, crimping may or may not work um, with your timing, but tilling will, uh, if you do the four seed mix or something like that, then the tilling will uh, take care of all of it. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And, and I'm very fond of the, the winter rye. I've used that just for soil and erosion reasons in the past yeah. too, and it worked quite well. Yeah, and you don't like you you irrigate it for a week or two just to get it started. Um, make sure that you know what, as soon as it sprouts, you don't have to water it again the whole fall, winter, and spring. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, the winter rye can survive on four inches of water a year. Very cool. Cool. Any other questions? Scott, uh, I know that you have some some land that you're wanting to uh, put in uh, hay production. Do you have any questions for cover cropping? All right, maybe not. Um, one thing I'll uh, throw out there that um, if you're looking to have um, – forage and cattle grazing the land um, during the winter, um, that uh, that two month growth in August and September of a high diversity blend can add a lot of protein into the um, residue left behind that the um, cattle or horses can then forage over the winter. And um, so you can you can do a, a really short uh, fast growth and then all of those you know radishes and turnips are still there for them to you know kick up and dig up and stuff um, throughout the winter and add a different food source along with a, a pasture grass or something like that would you have any cover crop go-to's for helping suppress bindweed for bindweed, uh, absolutely. So I actually had awful bindweed when I first moved out here four years ago. I didn't know what it was. And I was like, oh, it's beautiful morning glory. Let it flower and seed everywhere. The next year I was like, oh, that was the wrong choice. And then um, I had bindweed completely filling my garden. Um, so uh, what I did was a uh, uh, in the, let's see, in September, I just seeded winter wheat just winter wheat. Um, so I tilled seeded winter wheat and then let the winter wheat grow all um, fall, winter, spring. And when the bindweed would be coming up now in you know April and May, 
that winter wheat had grown so much and so dense and covered the ground that the bindweed couldn't come up. And within one year, so, so then uh, in the end of May, when I was planting my stuff, I tilled in the, uh, the winter wheat and planted our other crops and also planted red medium clover as a living mulch into everything else we were planting so that there was something else to be growing in, are in the areas where we didn't have plants. And uh, that first year, just by having the winter wheat grow all fall, winter, spring and be able to outcompete the bindweed in the spring by already being established and growing, um, we had about a 90% reduction in bindweed. And then we did the same thing the next winter, but with a mixture of winter wheat and red medium clover. And that following year, we had a further 90%. Essentially, we had one or two plants that we picked out by hand that we saw, and that was it. And I have seen zero bindweed yet this year. Wow. That's, uh, so, that's remarkable. Yeah, I am gonna I am gonna be switching from winter wheat to winter rye, um, just because it'll get more growth and be um, even more beneficial. Um, the winter wheat uh, the winter wheat just has to be planted a little earlier out here than we really can because it really should be planted in August, or sorry, uh, mid August to to early September, um, to really get established before the cold sets in in October. Um, it can germinate in October, but it just doesn't do real well um, as opposed to the winter rye. The winter rye, you can wait until you've, you know, wait until mid-October when you've completely finished all of your last harvest, and then you can seed uh, winter rye, and it'll do just fine. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, we're, um, with Growing Ford Farm, we're actually scheduling a, a tractor operator to come out and uh, we'll be tilling in the winter wheat uh, or disking it in and uh, putting down the cover crop, um, the, the cocktail mix that, that we have. Spring mix, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just uh, for those that may be curious, that's going to include hairy vetch bursting, um, clo uh, bursting clover, um, mustard, yellow buckwheat, cow peas, forage radish, Austrian filled peas, lentils, a foxtail millet, a forage collard, forage turnip, and annual ryegrass. Yeah, so pretty excited. And that cover crop mix will be a good one that um, uh, some of it can then be, you know, tilled in later if needed, or you'll actually be able to plant directly into that one. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of crops. Um, so that'll be, that'll be cool. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, um, go-to places that you like to get your cover crop seeds? Uh, I've typically get most of it from Southwest seed company up in Cortez, um, cause they're local. Um, I do also highly recommend checking out the greencoverseed.com. Um, can somebody type that in chat? Greencoverseed.com. I got you. Um, yeah, and that website has a seed mix calculator where you can basically look at all of the different seeds that I was listing on those different slides. Um, and you can go to their website and build your own mix based on your goals, your um, your soil types, your you know what you're trying to achieve, all that kind of stuff, and it'll help you um, build your seed mix. It's it's a pretty cool website. Uh, any more questions for Andy? This is, this is your chance if you have questions. Or you can always uh, email us or call us. Uh, Melissa, if you're still there, if you wouldn't mind throwing my contact info in the uh, chat, that'd be cool. Will do. Thanks. And if you're interested in a more in-depth um, you know, workshop on cover crops uh, on Saturday, the last Saturday of this month, or not the last, sorry, second to last Saturday of this month. Um, I don't have the calendar in front of me. Melissa, do you have the date on that one? Be the 23rd. 23rd, yeah, that sounds right. On the 23rd, we're hosting a in, uh, Managing Invasive Weeds and Cover Cropping 
uh, Backyard Conservation Workshop. It's a three hour workshop through uh, San Juan College as our partners. And uh, you can register through San Juan College's website and you can get more information about that workshop and our other backyard conservation workshops. We've got a different topic each month. They're each about three hours long. Um, we have everything from rainwater harvesting, low impact development, landscaping to harvest rainwater. Thanks for posting the link there, Melissa. Um, managing invasive weeds, um, mulching, uh, composting. The last workshop we just had was composting and we show, were able to show five different styles of composting, including a cover crop composting. Um, and yep, there we go. Uh, uh, June is that managing wildlife, attracting pollinators and beekeeping. So yeah, if you're interested, check out those workshops um, to learn more. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much, Andy, for the presentation. Yeah, no worries. And, uh, Thanks for inviting yeah, me. Absolutely. Uh, you're always a wealth of knowledge and, um, yeah, fun to listen to. And I appreciate you um, actually taking us outside a little bit and seeing what you got going on.